You got to teach me that surf. Underarm. The underarm surf. Is that, is that it? Is yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Like that? yeah, that's a good technique. We're going to get you down to Australia. No. Come in the box, watch me play. I can be in the Curios box. Yeah. Can I take my shirt off? Fuck yeah. Oh, nice. Of course. Welcome to Hanukuma's Good Trouble, where we celebrate those who have the courage to disrupt the North. I'm Nick Kyrgios, professional tennis player and your host. In each episode, we'll sit down with game changers who aren't afraid to rock the boat. We'll dig into their stories and the waves they've made in their worlds for the better. Welcome to Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios. Today, I'm joined by Rain Wilson, forever synonymous with the hit series, The Office. Besides being the former assistant to the regional manager, the reigning champion of mockumentary sitcoms, is an Emmy-nominated podcaster, producer, writer, director, and soulful author. He's all that and a bag of beats, or as he puts it, just another luminous spiritual being having a beautiful and difficult existence, a perfect description for the star of titles such as Galaxy Quest and Six Feet Under. Nick. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, I have a suggestion for a title for your show. Just a little bit curious. (laughs) I'm curious what you think. Again, I'm playing with words. It's a pun. I mean, look, good trouble is good, though. All right. All right. I like it, though. I like it. Curiosity. No. So, I mean, let's jump straight into it. Rain, welcome to Good Trouble. And what does good trouble mean to you? I think it's up to everyone to make some good trouble uh, in terms of trying to make the world a better place. And sometimes that takes some sharp elbows and that's okay. And in your case, a sea of broken tennis rackets. <laughs> your parents were both heavily in, in, in arts and I'd imagine they have a pretty strong influence on your career and how they helped you. Yeah, you know, my dad passed away a few years back. Um, He was kind of the most important force in my life because my mom took off when I was about a year and a half and I stayed with my dad. On the positive aspect, my parents very much loved the arts, encouraged me to go into the arts, encouraged me to read and write and and paint and draw and and act. And they also were members of the Baha'i faith. And so Baha'is love to explore all the world's faith traditions. So we would to meditation and we had family prayers. We would read texts, holy texts from a lot of different faith traditions. So I feel really grateful for that. But there was a lot of family dysfunction too. And that didn't help the old uh, mental health journey. I describe it like when I was growing up, my family was so weird. They were like kind of hippie, bohemian, Baha'i weirdos. And I didn't know how to like fit in. So I would watch people interact. I would imitate them. Like if I, if I saw a guy and he like came in to the lunchroom and he's like, hey brother, and he high five, like, how's it going, how's your weekend? I would like note that and be like, okay, that's how normal people interact. And then I would go and try and, hey brother, how was your weekend? It was like an alien trying to learn about how humans interact. So what's, you know, what about yourself do you find funny? Really, you want a list? Yeah, if there is one. I have a gigantic head. Looks like a cassava melon. My torso is abnormally long. Um, so I guess, look, times have kind of changed. Social media and, you know, there's so many digital personalities. When you took your stuff to, I guess, the internet or websites or socials, did you ever look up to someone that helped you with all that? Like, who were some of the influencers, if any? Boy, I, that's, a great, that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that before. And I, I, I don't know how to answer it. You know, I love, I know you had Jay Shetty on your show. I love what he does in, the, in spreading his message of joy. He just does it, seems to do it so effortlessly. And I also appreciate there's some stand up comics like Theo Vaughn and Burke Kreischer that are, that are hysterical and, but also like have like a, a good human message that they're getting. They're not just telling like fart jokes, you know? But social media, it's like, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Like, there's so much you can do on social media that's positive and it can connect people. It can inspire people. It can tell stories. But at the same time, you've got generations of people just staring at their phones. Ooh. Is it worth it? Maybe I should just unplug all of that social media. I'm not sure, but I'm trying, I'm trying to put a positive message. I'm letting people know about who I am, what my journey is. And on Soul Boom, we're starting a whole Soul Boom brand. I'm starting a Soul Boom podcast. I'd love to have you on it sometime. <laughs> and, um, trying to have 
kind of inspiring, uplifting spiritual conversations with young people in a new, fresh, kind of irreverent yep. and fun way. And I, I think that's a valuable service. But what, what about you? Do you think it's, you think it's worth it? I mean, <clears throat> I think you, a lot I know of you, I know you tell people to eat a lot of dicks on social media. Yeah, so especially Piers Morgan. Yeah, I would do that. I would say that to him. Yeah, it's just like I think. You know, my when I was young and I came onto social media, I only followed people and really wanted to look at people that I enjoyed seeing what they did behind the scenes. Like I would, I looked at your social media for like thirty minutes and I was watching your tennis videos, and that's I think that's all positive. That's all joy, and yours bringing you, you made me smile. But there's also so much negative energy that's on there. You know, it gives everyone an opportunity to kind of critique someone's work and just spit venom into people's yeah, faces. And I just, yeah. don't, I, I don't like it and I haven't always dealt with it the best. You know, it's hurtful, some of the things that yeah. are said. The same like everywhere you go, it's just people just sliding and looking at the screen and scrolling. It was this big, weird social experiment. It's like, let's drop these little miniature computers into everyone's pockets and then let's connect them on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and there's unlimited porn, there's unlimited distraction, there's unlimited connectivity and opinions, mm. and the algorithms are all wired for outrage. So the more outrage you get, the more you click and the more you send and the more you interact. So the more money they make, um, we haven't figured it out. This giant social experiment has, has really been a train wreck. And like culturally, there has to be a reckoning. Um, and I do think a lot of the responsibility are the companies themselves because they, they have no problem spreading just massive yeah. disinformation. They have no problem spreading like hateful racist messages. Um, but like you say, I like those videos of the otter when people adopt otters and they live in their kitchen. Yeah. I mean, come on. Puppy videos, all that type of stuff. I don't know about the puppies, but the otter, the beavers, the, the llamas. Anything with like unusual animals, like makes my day. So where does your sense of like humanity come from and, and want to make the stuff that matters? I went through a really hard time in my 20s. I dealt with a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, addiction issues. And the only thing I knew to do was to kind of explore spiritual solutions. So I dove into reading a lot of the great spiritual books of the great faith traditions and it helped me a lot. It helped me a great deal. So it's kind of weird because people know me as a sitcom actor and playing kind of an annoying doofus. And I am kind of an annoying doofus. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, but, you know, I have this other side. I say I kind of have this kind of like secret inner Oprah going <laughs> on. I feel like I'm two different people. When I'm on the court, I'm this guy who is crazy, you know, volatile. You know, everyone I meet, they're like, you're so different off the court. And I feel like you and I have some similarities with that. Everyone's expecting you to be the person that you were in front of the cameras and not really embracing you for who you are as a person. As I wrote, I wrote this book, The Bassoon King, that was like an, a comedic journey of my life, you know, and it, talk about the office and being a struggling actor in New York. Grew up a high, moved to New York, wanted to be an actor, didn't want anything to do with God, spirituality, morality, any of that nonsense. And then when I was really struggling, especially with anxiety and depression, turned back. I think as a culture, we've jettisoned religion so much, uh, a lot of times for a good reason, but I say we've thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater. What's your spiritual background or religious faith background? Well, I'm Greek Orthodox. Okay. And, you know, every time I'm back home, you know, my... Do you wear any of the funny hats or anything? No, I don't wear any funny no? hats. But I mean, Do you have look, like an incense thing? Then? The, well, the, the priest does when we go to church. Okay. kind of, you know, throws it around. Yeah. But I mean, look, my grandma, my yaya, my, on my Greek side always said, you know, try and come to church as much as you can. It'll help you on court. And obviously, you know, I just went to make her happy, but I'm sure it helped me in some shape or form. But every time I went into there, I felt like it was a sacred place. And I definitely, mm -hmm. it couldn't hurt me in any way, shape or form. So, yeah, I definitely think you know, with good trouble, what I'm doing now. And as you said, doing other things other than just breaking rackets and playing tennis, I think I should definitely give it a go and then explore that type of stuff. With the obvious success with The Office, you know, being one of the most iconic characters and, and roles, did it change you for the better or worse, you know, all the success you had there? I struggled so much in New York. I spent 10 years, like, barely paying the rent as a theater actor, you know, making like $700 a week, working odd jobs. And then 
a few years later, I get on the greatest job you could ever ask for. I mean, tons of money, great attention, the best cast and writers you could ask for, an amazing character. Like, it's beyond my wildest dreams. And yet, when I look back on it now, I was like, God, you know, I spent a big chunk of my time in the office pretty fucking miserable. You opened up on, I think it was a podcast where you said you kind of were taught your whole life to kind of make it and then you would be happy. That would equal happiness. And yeah. you basically said it's all bullshit. And when you were young, you were taught like, you know, you, you have these amazing results, you're making good money. And then yeah. when I was thrown into the spotlight, that's when all my negative thoughts started happening. And I was actually more insecure rather than when I was trying to just, I was just playing. I was a young kid enjoying it. Then I was thrown into the spotlight, making better money than most people, but I was so yeah. unhappy. We always want more. You know, there's, it's a materialistic thing. It's a capitalistic thing. It's a consumerist thing. It's like Theodore Roosevelt once said, uh, envy is the thief of joy, you know, but I spent some time in envy of other actors and I just, I wanted more. And here I am in this incredible opportunity and really struggling. Like I want to have bigger movies. I want to have, you know, more accolades or whatever. I want to not just be nominated for Emmys. I want to win Emmys. Thanks, Jeremy Piven. It, it took me a long time, a lot of therapy to kind of unravel that and, you know, not try and tie my internal happiness with any externals because that's, again, how we're wired. It took me, it took me a lot of work. How are you doing on your, on your journey? Yeah, I was just about to say, I think Struggle. when I was really worried about other people's results or, you know, I was like, well, I wanted to win a grand slam. When I was really focused on result-based things, I think, I think that's when I was at my most unhappy. Where okay. I mean, last year I had a great year, you know, was making finals of grand slams and I was just I was taking care of my mental health off the court, you know, my partner, my family, my relationships. And I just felt like I wasn't thinking about wanting more. It was just going out there and getting the best out of myself. And I had, you know, one of the best years on tour. Obviously, I could have done more things or had better results last year, but I'm so content with, because I know I got, I did the best I could and I'm yeah. happy with that. And I feel like when you have that inner peace. I feel like th there was something about your stroke that changed too. If it was like on your forehands, you were like, this is my imitation of your forehand. Are you kidding me? That wasn't out. Fuck you. You're saying that was out. God. Ah. I was not expecting that. So I, I was like, really? I was like, he's going to show me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously. Also, just make sure to, to follow through. Yes, in a little high. Point, point the cap at where you're hitting it. Yeah. So Always going to take some advice. From Sorry, go ahead. Fellow tennis players. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's been discussion around mental health, but particularly in regards to comedians in the past and recent years. Did that have any influence of you doing, you know, any projects of Soul Pancake or Laughing Matters? You know, we did this uh, documentary called Laughing Matters that you referenced. I had this digital media company called Soul Pancake that was all about creating positive, uplifting, inspiring content. And we had this documentary about like the link between mental health and comedy because so many comedians have these issues. I don't know that we like discovered any kind of like hard fact. Yep. I know for me, like trying to make people laugh and entertain was something that I did for attention. I had a really, in one hand, a really loving, wonderful family and another hand, a really like dysfunctional, unloving family. Mm -hmm. But if I could make them laugh, then I made the house better. Trying to make people laugh is attention seeking, approval seeking, you know, wanting people to like me. Uh, trying to fit in. And if I could make the kids at school, I was this dorky, pimply, goofball kid. I know that's hard to imagine. But if I could make the kids at school laugh, like the girls gave me attention yep. and the kids didn't beat me up in the on the playground. When I first came on the tour, I was so out of pocket, like with the normal tennis player, you know, at that time it was like Andy Murray, Federer, these gentlemen that was so clean cut and I came on the scene and I was like, wow, this is so strange. Cause yeah. like the thing about tennis is we spend the whole day with our competitors. We're in the same locker room. We shower next to each other. We eat next to each other and we just go play against each other. It's so odd. And I saw them walking around. I was like, okay, I'll try and be more like Federer. So I tried to, you know, bring two bags to the courts, really organized, tried to be really clean and proper. And it just, for, for the first couple of years, I didn't feel myself and I felt so, yeah. I was like, this is sport is just so foreign to me. Yeah, I was really doubting whether I would have a long career because I was like, I'm really struggling to fit in. And then I guess there was a point where I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to be myself. You know, I started wearing basketball jerseys on court and everyone was like, what is he doing? Yeah. And that's when I think I had my best success when I just 
expressed myself. I had a similar story where I was pursuing a career in the theater in New York. And theater in New York is kind of the similar, is like Roger Federer. There's a way to do it. Like yep. you're a trained actor and you go to Juilliard and you stand a certain way and you are, you know, you have a certain comportment and yeah. stuff. And I got my first Broadway show and I was trying to do that. And I was trying to please other people and, and to fit in and be this idea of like what a New York theater actor was. And I sucked yeah. and I was bad in the play, had a miserable experience, bombed. And coming out of that, I was like, fuck that. I'm never going to do that again. Like I need to be myself. I'm an ungainly, weird and wonderful guy. And I wear glasses and I get my clothes at thrift stores and I need to be true to who Rain Wilson is. And I, and I think because I went through that, I never would have been successfully played Dwight on The Office had I not gone through that really miserable experience. And it helped me find my authentic voice, which is, you know, a little little left of center. Yeah, you know? it's different. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. When in your career did you feel like you you made it? Was it that moment? I would say it was really after The Office. Like it's been 10 years since The Office is over. And I've done a good dozen movie roles and a bunch of television and some plays, gone back to the theater somewhat. And like, this is the career that I've always wanted. Like I make a living, I play some cool characters. People may not be watching the stuff that I'm doing, but I don't really care as much. You know, unlike being a professional athlete, we have a very narrow shelf life. Does, yeah. I want to die on stage doing King Lear. I want to keel over in a heart attack at age 89. But that's the cool thing about acting. You don't retire, you just keep going. going. Yeah. I'm sure many people still recognize you as Dwight. Are there still any similarities between you and Dwight? <laughs> Dwight and Rain both are kind of socially awkward and don't fit in and have kind of a skewed way of seeing the world. Which is good trouble, by the way. Which is good trouble. But beyond that, there's not really that many similarities. The thing I love about the theater is... Uh, you get trained in the theater to just play characters. I played dozens of characters before I played Dwight. Dwight was the one that really took off. I've played dozens of characters since I played Dwight. And that's where I get off the most. Like I get a script and there's some kind of offbeat dude. And like, how am, how am I Rain gonna suit who I am and portray that offbeat dude? And I'm so lucky, I'm so blessed that I get to make a career of doing that. For a dorky kid from suburban Seattle with the weird family and the, and the pimples and the giant head, it's beyond a, a dream come true. And sitting here with Nick Kyrgios. I think it's the other way around. I'm sitting here with Ray Wilson. Oh man, I wish I was sitting here with Federer, but I'll take what I can get. Well. You know, one of your recent projects, uh, Geography of Bliss, what kind of lessons did you say? Because you went to some pretty really nice places and then go versus some pretty bad places as well. I went to Iceland is one of the happiest places. Well, and I went to Bulgaria, which is one of the unhappiest places. I still found a lot of misery in Iceland and I found a lot of uh, joy in Bulgaria. But like one of the things we did in Iceland was there's this group of women and there's like 50 or hundred women and they meet every morning and they sing and they dance and they hold hands and then they march into the Arctic Ocean. It's like 48 degrees. I don't know what that is in your stupid temperature system. Um, and then they're singing and, and dancing and you know, doing a cold plunge, but building community around it. The thing I learned there is like in Bulgaria, because they have been so oppressed by you know, the Turks invaded, and then it was the Nazis, and then it was the Soviets, and there were so many spies. There's so little trust of neighbors and so little trust of government. You don't see Bulgarians holding hands and doing something as a group like that. So I think one of the big lessons from it was like, we're social creatures. We need to connect. We need to celebrate together. And that's how humans thrive. That's how we thrived since the beginning of time. That's how we thrived in in caves and valleys, you know, in our early years. And, you know, the, the, the countries that are the least happy are the most disconnected. We see the mental health epidemic and skyrocketing. Uh, we see political discord. We see injustice rearing its head constantly. Maybe it's us staring at screens 
Maybe it's us not gathering in churches and community centers the way that we used to, but we've got to find a way to build community and come back together to help alleviate this. So, I mean, you've got so much going on at the moment, so many projects. What was it that really got you to kind of sit down and write Soul Boom? Because I was reading into it and it's, it's pretty good. Oh, cool, man. You know, I hate to say it, but something good for me came out of COVID. All of a sudden when COVID hit in March of 2020, and I knew I wasn't going to be acting for a long time. And I was like, okay, this is it. I was unshowered and I was in my boxers and my robe and headed down to my office and just started writing this book. I didn't know if anyone would buy it. Dwight is writing a book on spirituality. Give me a break. But it got rejected by 12 of the 13 publishers we sent it out to. I'm just so thrilled that I, I, I got that opportunity to, to get that down on paper. I said, this is kind of like my getting hit by a bus book. I walk out these doors and get hit by a bus. Like I've got my, here's everything I thought and believed in case anyone cared what the guy from the office thinks about anything. It's Plenty right. people care. Plenty oh. people care. Look at you. I don't know if you know, I have my own foundation as well. And there was one particular moment with me where I went to a kid's hospital in France. I still remember it. And, you know, I'm meeting with kids that maybe don't have long left and that some tennis fans. And I was in there and I was like, this is kind of a moment for me where I knew that I had a bit of a platform where I could help yeah. and do something like that. And, you know, it's been an ongoing thing for me. And I never thought that I'd have, like Nick Kyrgios, have the platform or the reach to do something like that. When did you discover that you wanted to do all these ventures and business things to help others? In the Baha'i faith, we're taught, like, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age that you live in. If you have a deep compassion for the suffering of others, let that drive you. I've always felt that kind of responsibility. And like you said, platform. All of a sudden in the office and I had a platform and all of a sudden millions of people cared about what I thought. I was like, well, shit, I better, I better do something. Yeah. And so, you know, I've been working more in philanthropy and, you know, with Soul Pancake and Soul Boom. Um, trying to kind of foster these conversations. And but I think you don't have to be a celebrity to, to make a positive impact. And that's really important for people to know. Like you, you influence your sphere, you know, you positively impact uh, your little arena. You know, it can be your, your family. It can be your, your cul-de-sac, your church, your school, your place of work that it's grassroots is where that change really happens. But I think that more and more that's starting to spread as people realizing like, oh, it's not enough to just live a nice, comfortable life. And that's, that's kind of where you, you came to, like, I'm making millions of dollars. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fed it uh, as a, as a celebrity and you could just enjoy that, but you're also, you know, giving back. And I think everyone has some kind of responsibility to, to give back in that way. The thing that kind of moves me the most, like I just did a signing at like this Comic-Con thing the other day and like people come up tearfully and they say, you don't understand how much the office means to me and my family. I was going through hell and COVID. I was sick. My family was sick. My parents were getting divorced, whatever. Like that laughter and the peace and the joy that that show has brought me and my family like means so much. And you know, we didn't go into the office thinking, oh, we're going to help people. We yeah. were trying to buy houses, you know, we were trying to like make a decent comedy and yeah. have a job and pay off our student loans. And I have been encouraged to share about my own struggles because a lot of times young people, especially when they're struggling, they feel all alone. They're not alone. And it's so important to know, like, we're all, we all have our struggles and especially folks that are quote unquote successful. <laughs> uh, it's really important to share that. Um, and it, 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 is, it, helps, it helps people a lot. I know you said you were like, for the majority of the office, you were miserable. But I'm sure I that... Wouldn't, uh, you want to take that say back? the majority of that. I wouldn't say... It? The headlines ran with that when I was talking about it. But yep. it was off and on for a few years yes. of the office that I was... And I wouldn't even say miserable, but just like, I didn't appreciate it the way that I should have. Mm. I didn't just savor it. Like... This is as good as it gets, man. Yep. Just enjoy it. And, and I think all of us humans have that sometimes. Take, you know? it, take it for granted at some time. Yeah. I mean, you, I'm sure yeah, you I, were I miserable definitely. for years on the pro tour. Like, yeah, dude, yeah. Yeah, I know. you were like top 20 tennis player and making millions and touring the world. Yeah. And, 
And like during that time and like- yeah, I was walking out the center court of Wimbledon and I, I look back at it now and I can reflect and it's like, wow, what a moment. I've done that multiple times. Yeah. And then there was a couple of times where I was just like, took it for granted. I was like, I hate this. I was miserable. And then I look back and I'm yeah. like, why was I thinking that way? Yeah. Yeah. But you obviously probably have some more famous friends than I do and, and probably more friends in general. But is it important to you to encourage your peers and people like that to spread awareness and help? Like, is that a priority for you? I think that there's a lot more that celebrities could be doing to use their platform to make the world a better place, whether it's environment, mental health, pick your cause. Even if it's just raising money for specific causes, I think that people could put their money where their mouth is a lot more. I do feel like people, when they get a bit of a platform and they reach a level of, I guess, success, they do have the obligation to give back. I know plenty of athletes who don't do that. We all have our platform. Yeah. Like you and I have a larger platform and the... Someone has a smaller platform, but you know, use your platform to cause some good trouble. There's great crisis and injustice going on. There's the mental health epidemic, there's climate change, systemic racism. There's all kinds of issues that need our help and everyone's got a role to play. There's a great quote I heard recently, and it was basically, God lives where your deep gladness meets the world's deep hunger. And I love that idea that we all have stuff that we're passionate about uh, that gives us like that deep fulfillment. And how does that intersect with what the world needs? You could be on a, on a meetup that you do, you know, at the grassroots, it can be some volunteering that you do at the local library or school. But to me, that pretty much says it all. And I find that really inspiring. And, you know, I heard there were some brief rumors um, you know, recently about the office reboot. Yeah. Um, are you spearheading that? And I think I'd be a pretty good I think special you'd guest. You'd be great. Is it going to come back? Um, I'm going to say it right here and right now. In fact, I'm going to use this show to make this special announcement. I have no idea. We have a character that loses their shit and needs to smash things and swear uh, umpires are reps. That happened, then, barely happens. Oh, only watched, barely. Yeah. You've only watched Little Every Mermaid. Every time. <laughs> it's funny every time. Dude. This is my show. You're making me look bad. Okay. No, I know. I know. Those are just the juicy YouTube highlights yeah. of Nick Curios. It's millions and millions of people <laughs> see. Thanks for watching. For more Hanakuma's Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.